for those of you who don't know me, I am Katherine Haskins and I'm one of the co-founders of the Bridge Club. This was founded specifically to help pet owners have real authentic conversations with veterinary professionals when you're not in the hospital and when you're not on a telemedicine call. This is so, I always like to say that this is like when you're sitting next to a veterinarian on an airplane or a technician on an airplane, you find out that they're in animal health. Oh, Jenny's losing her mind. And that this, this is when you go, oh my God, they said, hello, they made eye contact. I can ask them every single question I have about animal health. That's what this is. This is your, your opportunity. We have two of the most amazing certified veterinary technicians in the chat. If you've got questions, this is how you can help get them answered. And we're gonna ladder many of them on up uh, to Dr. Shea, who is an amazing human being. And then we are also putting this on Facebook Live right now. So for those of you on Facebook that also have questions, please uh, put those questions out so that we can make sure we are also helping answer those as well. Um, I wanted to see to make sure we're getting really close um, to the start. We got two minutes out. Shay, do you have anything you want to add before I'm going to turn this over and make this all about you? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm doing great. Thanks. <laughs> it's been, well, last time we had you on, you had just spent the day talking all about telemedicine uh, and you were uh, talking all day long. Was today the same or were you seeing patients today? Uh, no, actually, my mom and dad came into town, so I spent the day talking to them, which has been great. So it's been a nice change of, change of pace. Didn't so that feel good when, well, <laughs> I'm sorry? I said, it's always good to have your mom and dad around. I tell you, there is nothing like that. I ended up getting um, my first hug uh, from uh, a family member that was we hadn't been close to. And I'll be honest with you, I welled up. I got really, it was amazing to go, it's, uh, to have that moment of, oh, I can hug you was pretty powerful. So um, I do hope many of us all get to do that again uh, very, very soon, but please be safe now. Please be safe now. Kurt, so good to see you down there. I just saw you pop up on the screen. Uh, we're getting a good amount of attendance. We got about a minute left, so get your beverage uh, as we're doing this. Um, Maggie's mom, South Florida. You guys, please, yeah, tell us where you're at. Where are you, where are you calling in from? or dialing in, can't use dialing anymore because that says I'm getting old uh, based on that, you know? And Kurt, you changed your background. You're in a different spot, I'm noticing that. Uh, and hey, listen, you guys, if you can't turn a camera on, I totally understand it. I will say you kind of miss out a little bit on it um, just from the perspective of this is all about a real authentic engagement. Um, so we are at the top of the hour. I'd like to welcome everyone on Facebook Live. I'd like to welcome everyone here on Zoom to another uh, edition of the Bridge Club Pets. Um, this is for you and we are really excited um, to bring together a conversation all about helping our pets and managing their pain. Um, I do wanna remind everybody that this is being recorded so that you are aware of that. Um, you did have to give your permission when you came in. Um, what we have that's unique about this conversation is we do have two amazing, amazing certified veterinary technicians in the chat. So this is your opportunity to ask questions uh, and to get real insight from them. Um, and what we're gonna do is jump on into this great conversation. We are so fortunate um, to be joined for a second time by Dr. Shay Cox. So Dr. Cox is the founder of Pet Hospice. So I. Uh, I get it, it's gonna be a little sad there. We're gonna talk a little bit, it's gonna hurt our feelings, um, but it is real what she does and she's one of the foremost authorities in hospice care. And we'll talk a little bit about also what does that actually mean? Um, so she really does focus on technology and innovation in pet care um, and really wants to change the view of end of life landscape for veterinary medicine and what us pet owners uh, view. She's kind of a really cool lady. I'm just gonna say that because she's also authored 12 books um, and has done over 125, I may have this hour wrong on this, Dr. Yeah. Shea, but 125 hours of that. I feel like it's more than that. 
that you've educated <laughs> folks. Is that true? It, the certification program is 120 hours. Oh my gosh, it's just crazy. So she's also the past president of the International Association for Animal Hospice and Palliative Care. She's a huge telemedicine advocate and this section of pain management and end of life are becoming two of the fastest growing segments of telehealth uh, and virtual care right now. So it's important that we have this conversation. Um, so before we start and really dive in on the questions, we start and end every Bridge Club with a toast. So I ask for everyone to raise your glass and I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Shea for her to be able to start with the toast. All right, well, I'm gonna make this easy and just say no pain because that is the one thing we can do so much about and it is the most rewarding thing to be able to do. So here's to learning what to look for and how to do it. Oh my gosh, cheers to that, everybody. That was a little thing, that was fun. Okay, so let's start with the basic. Let's do dogs and cats. How can I tell if my pet is in pain? All right, well, that is the million dollar question, of course, and it can look different for both dogs and cats. And I think one of the most common misconceptions that I hear is you know, my pet isn't crying, my pet isn't whimpering, therefore they must not be in pain. When in reality, it's really rare for a dog or a cat to vocalize when they're in discomfort. They have a lot of other different behaviors that start off very subtle and then can escalate as pain escalates. So it could be something as simple as just that, you know, an older dog who gets up really slow or lays down really slow. And families will often attribute that to always just slowing down and getting getting old and really what that is is discomfort that's causing that slowing down so I mean how many people have have like a degree of back pain I mean I I do um, anyone anyone else I'm looking at the faces so when you get up after you've been sitting down for a while you're you know sometimes you're a little bit slow um, and it's not because you're old it's because you hurt <laughs> and the same thing can can happen with pets and so that is just you know one a uh, common, I think, th thing off of off the radar that we don't necessarily associate with pain, but but is. And for cats, one of the more common things of discomfort is a change in behavior. So they quit jumping up to counters. They quit jumping up to higher places. Um, they become a little more socially withdrawn. So there's really a whole spectrum of, you know, what does pain look like from mild down on the, the low end up to severe up on the high end. And one of the things that I put together was, it's called a beat pain scale. And this is something that Catherine and I can make available to you. It's on our website, but it's one of those things where I kept seeing time and time again, the same signs coming up to the surface for dogs and for cats. And there wasn't really a good pain scale to help educate pet parents on what that actually looks like. And you don't know what you don't know. So I wanted to create a pain scale that would help people be able to look at behaviors that are happening in their home with their pet and match it to a level of discomfort and sort of get a better picture of where, where their pet's pain might be. Um, so I do want to dive in just a little bit on this. Let's get some examples, right? So you talk about like they may not have jumped, they may not jump up on on what they, you know, the couch or something of that nature. Do like when it initially starts, do we see them try to and fail? Uh, or is it do they circle around it and then just kind of go, it's too much effort and they walk away? I mean, can you kind of help us so we know what we're looking for? Yeah, well, you know, cats, they never follow the rules. Um, no cat ever does the same thing as another cat. They like to, uh, they like to do everything on, on their own, on their own terms. So it's not something that you see as, you know, this day they're this way and then the next day they've, they've changed. It's a very subtle continuum that happens where just behaviors begin to slowly change. Um, one of the big things with cats, as far as 
showing signs that they hurt, not necessarily, you know, jumping up to high places, it, it, it's harder on their little bones to get up and, and cause that jump. So that's one common sign. But like grooming is another really big thing. Um, you know, kitties start to stop their grooming when they get older. It, it gets harder to reach those, those back end areas, <laughs> um, you know, when you're old and hurting. So oftentimes you'll see them look a little more matted, a little more unkempt. They don't clean themselves like they used to. Um, sometimes they overclean themselves because you know a joint hurts so you'll start to see excessive grooming sometimes so it's not necessarily a very um, everyone does the same every pet does the same thing it can be very different for each pet so a kitty that has hip pain that's not jumping up on the counter that might be their first sign of pulling back from those behaviors. Then as the pain worsens, maybe they're grooming a lot on their sides or their bellies. And you think, do they have fleas? Are they, do they have an allergy? When what they're trying to do is self-soothe an area that hurts. Sort of like if you bonk your arm, you're like, oh, ow, that hurt. Um, that's essentially what they're doing is they're trying to soothe an area that is painful. Um, or with kitties stretching, you know, kitties, they love a good long stretch. Um, that also can begin to to hurt, so they will not have their stretching behaviors as much. Yeah. So it's a lot of it is just you know knowing knowing what your kitty normally does, and then looking at a list of all of the signs that could indicate discomfort, and putting the puzzle pieces together. And it's it's a tool to help just raise awareness. And I like to think of it as the language of pain, because you, you know, you, as I said, you don't know what you don't know. So if it's, it's hard to know if your pet's in discomfort, if you don't know what the signs are to look for to begin with, which is not as easy as one would think. Um, you know, our pets make it very challenging. So what I will say is you guys are being kind of quiet in the chat tonight. I want to be sure that you guys are asking your, your questions because we got quite a few amazing uh, CVTs. So please feel free to ask those questions. Um, but like one of the things that we're seeing that they're changing their behavior, what happens if, I mean, so we've really been having a conversation at home about getting some more stools around the house to help Lily, because we've seen her take herself out a few times trying to jump up on the bed or jump up on the couch. Um, should we be making changes to help them as they're getting older or are we not, then we're, should be going to see the veterinarian? Yeah, well, I think it's it's a combination. So like with anything in medicine, it's, it's not always a either or. It's a how do we put everything that's available to us together in the best in the best way. And so I think definitely going to your veterinarian is the is a step in all of this. The caveat is when pets get to the vet, just they they don't they're nervous their adrenaline's going or they're excited to see a new person like oh my god it's the vet and oh my god I'm so happy um so they they don't necessarily show their behaviors that there's at home so that's another reason why it's so important to recognize these things um you know we look at so many medical records and you know reports of no pain because we don't see it in a clinic setting um so learning the behaviors and reporting those behaviors to your veterinarian, and then you can begin to formulate an idea that makes, makes sense. Um, like for example, cats, cats that are around the 12 year age, 90% have some form of arthritis already or degenerative joint wow, disease. Wow, really? And it's one of the best thing, one of the easiest things that we can help manage for, but it goes under diagnosed or underappreciated because they're so good at you know, not, not having outward signs of discomfort. So do animals have the same kind of pain pathways as we do, or is it different in dogs and cats? I mean, let's talk about how that pain kind of manifests. Yeah, so that is a very fascinating um, just area in of itself. And it, there are many types of pain pathways in the body. There's neuropathic pain ways, there's inflammatory pathways. There, if you picture all these little highways in your body and all of them can transmit pain in different ways. And so when you're managing pain, the best way to approach managing pain, depending on the level or severity of the pain is to 
treat as many of those pathways as possible in order to do the most well-rounded approach and to use the lower doses of medications and to provide the best, the best level of comfort for them. So there's a lot that's happening in the body. And the first step is to ascertain what level of pain your pet is and then figure out which pain pathways are probably contributing to the type of pain that's being presented and then treat accordingly. Um, you know, for example, dogs that have chronic arthritis and you know, they'll, a family will try Rimadyl and just Rimadyl and they're like, oh, we tried Rimadyl and it just didn't do anything for them. Um, or they try a medication called gabapentin and that is for chronic pain. And they say, well, I tried gabapentin and it just didn't really do anything for them. So, um, so we quit that medication. When in reality, these medications are working on two different pathways. And if you can put them together, you that's where the magic happens. Um, it's so kind of like the Tylenol Advil, like there are two different pain receptors to be able to help. So if you're having to be put on more than one. Exactly. So Tylenol works on the little receptors in the brain and, you know, Advil works on the inflammatory receptors in the body. So you can use those two to hit different targets in the, in the body. Um, For humans. <laughs> and for pets too. So um, not Advil necessarily, but but we, we use Tylenol all the time for dogs. It's, it's lethal to cats um, when that is um, something you can't use in kitties, but it is a piece of the pain management plan that we use in dogs all the time with chronic arthritis, especially those that cannot take um, an NSAID like Rimadyl or Medicam. So we're getting some great questions coming up in the chat, but I did want to ask because I wanted to ask you about, you know, how we approach treating pain, but like, so if our cat has a urinary tract infection or, you know, we're seeing some loss of teeth is like, how would you on your scale, your pain scale, like, where is that for pets? And then, you know, how do we approach treating those types of pieces of pain? Yeah. So the first step, like when I approach pain is, you know, what disease is present in this pet and what is almost the human counterpart to, to experience of that pain. So for example, um, if anyone's had an infected tooth or a toothache, you know how much that hurts. Um, you know, it throbs and it's painful. So if you have a cat or a dog with, you know, yuck mouth and they have infected teeth, you know that that hurts. So there's a lot of parallel between, I mean, it's the same pain pathways um, in pets as it is people essentially. So if it hurts in people, it's going to hurt in pets. And that's one of the easiest ways to, I think, to think about things like that. Um, and it depends on what is actually um, happening. So with arthritis, you can have, just like people with back pain, you can have chronic dull pain that's always there, but then all of a sudden you can tweak something and now you have this acute on chronic or this sudden spike of pain on top of that pain that's always been there. And the thing with pain is it is such a dynamic experience. So, you know, your pain, your pet can have a pain level of say seven at some point through the day. And we use a pain scale of zero to 10, just like in humans, where 10 is the most excruciating pain and zero is no pain at all. And you can have a pet that has pain up to seven each day, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're living in that spot all day long. So just like with us, you can have these ups and downs of pain throughout the day. The goal is to bring in types of management that just kind of calms everything down. So those spikes are, are less um, high and low and shorter in between the, the owies, <laughs> so to speak. So, that, so, okay, I don't mean to be really like basic and rudimentary here, but uh, you know, we see dosage. You don't see pets very often have in medication that is given every four hours, like in humans. I mean, it tends to be like in the morning or before they go to bed. And so I am curious about that. If there's that ups and downs and that pain for them, how are we being able to make their lives a little more manageable? Well, it, that has to come down to the like a half-life of a medication, which means how long does that medication last in the body? So like with people, um, say if you're thinking of the every four hours, that's maybe Advil. If you have a headache, you can, you can do that. But 
again, that is, you know, your headache is not a chronic type of pain where it's like that every single day. So you have to take into content context, what is it, what exactly, what's the type of pain we're dealing with? How, how is it affecting them on a day-to-day -day basis? And most medications have either um, a half-life or an effective uh, analgesia of a certain amount of time. So whether that's every eight hours, like with gabapentin, or every 12 hours with like an anti-inflammatory, it's spaced out um, at that level because that's how long it lasts in the body. So we're throwing it, we're casting a big net. Okay. Some do things more frequently. Um, certain medications can't be dosed more frequently. So what we end up doing, that's the importance of addressing other pain pathways so that if twice a day, NSAID isn't cutting the pain relief, that means we need another layer added onto that that works on another pain pathway or in a different way to provide improved comfort. So I'm going to quickly, if I can get over to Brenda really fast. Brenda has a great question. And uh, if you guys all recall, as I've got people, I'm going to unmute her. Can I unmute you, Brenda? I can be able to unmute you. There, wait, there, I think you got it and I did it. There you go. Go for it, Brenda. Ask the question. <laughs> Sorry hey, about that, guys. Nothing like a three ring circus here. So a couple questions, Dr. Shea, about, so there are a lot of questions that are coming in the chat and it's leading me to, to, to see that it feels like some veterinarians maybe aren't taking the time to help them really discover what the source of the pain is versus just having pain medications. So I wonder if maybe you could talk about that a little bit and help give them some tools to encourage maybe deeper discussion than maybe they're getting right now. Absolutely. And boy, I, I sure do relate to how difficult it is to cover so much in you know a 15 or 20 minute visit that you that you have with the veterinarian, which is why I think it's so important to arm yourself with as much knowledge so that you can you know have these have these conversations with with your vet. Um, you know, I always <laughs> I use an example or an analogy that I remember when I was in college and. I was driving this old beat up Mustang and it was making the worst noises and it seized up on me. I went off the road, I lost control. And the mechanic was like, oh my God, that was a serpentine ring. Do you know you could have killed yourself with that? How long has your car been making this noise for? And I'm like, uh, and I'm like, oh, I, I don't know what all of these noises meant. I now know that it means there was something really wrong with my car. Um, but you know, if you don't know what those signs mean, it's hard to equate it to something. So I think learning the signs and then also, um, you know, understanding that say arthritis, if you're looking at a senior pet, say with arthritis, that is an inflammatory process. It's a chronic process, meaning it's around for, you know, for at least six months, in our senior dogs, it's, it's years. And so right then and there tells us we need a couple layers of pain management. Um, you know, whether that is an anti-inflammatory, which is the cornerstone for arthritis, gabapentin, which is that chronic neuropathic, meaning that nerve pain that, that keeps firing. And then other layers on top of that, um, you know, whether that's supplements or, um, nutraceuticals or CBD or acupuncture and massage. There's, there's, a, there's a whole lot of things that we can, that we can approach for. If it's something like say your pet had surgery, um, like a knee surgery, and that's something that we know, okay, that's going to be, this type of pain is going to be more short lived. It's going to be more acute in nature. So then these are the times we would reach for something like an op opioid on top of an anti-inflammatory, depending on the level. So I, I don't think I answered your question. <laughs> this, though, I think it's great because they're like, it explains that there's no like silver bullet for a lot of these things in pain. And they're various, like it's a cocktail of different things you need to help them solve it. But um, I think just, help, I, I just wondered if there were certain kinds of things that petters could watch for to help their veterinarian help them more readily get to what the problem is so they can get the right kind of, of pain management. Like video and stuff like that. So that, like you said, if they're in the vet clinic and they are not the cat or the dog, they have an adrenaline boost, right? And they're like, get me the, you know what, out of here. Yeah. Uh, that they're fine. like, I can, I'm fine. I'm good. I, there's no problem. And then the reality is there is a lot of pain. And so should 
pet owners start to come armed with some video or photos or a journal with documented behavior? Absolutely, and that's my, my shameless plug for telemedicine, um, <laughs> where, where it's, you can see a pet you know, in your home, but it's, to me, it is also learning the language of pain, so you can report what you're seeing to your veterinarian who can then be um, making that leap, like, oh, these are, you know, and there's, there's tools, like for kitty cats, there is a musculoskeletal feline pain index, um, which again, I can, I can supply these resources, but it's, it's a form that you can check for behaviors. A lot of this just comes down to behaviors. Changes in certain behaviors indicate discomfort and pain. And so it's being able to one, know what those are, two, reporting those to your veterinarian, and then putting all the pieces together. Um, you know, if your dog has something like a tumor on its liver, we know that it could be a certain type of pain because it stretches an organ capsule. I mean, that's just one example. Or if it's arthritis, it's a certain kind of pain. So I think it is, a lot of it comes down to, to knowing what to look for and then being able to communicate that. And video to me is, is awesome um where you know we have our hospice families all the time send us video clips and like just 30 seconds um if you 10 seconds and that can often be really telling of um you know of a level of pain you know how are they looking how are they interacting how are they eating how are their ears and their tails you know what how are they getting excited to go on a walk are the walks getting shorter are they getting grumpy with kids in the home that's a that's a, are they getting grumpy with other dogs it's another huge sign of of um discomfort as well so let's dive into there's this has kind of shown up in two places on facebook live so thank you for the question we really appreciate this this idea that that um, sometimes this 12 to 13 year old cat's legs seem to be giving out and so therefore has trouble jumping. But then we also see we as parents know that they shouldn't be jumping. So we're like, please don't jump on the couch. So <laughs> we know that, so it's kind of a combo thing is we know that they shouldn't be doing it. We know it's going to hurt them. Um, we know we can you work with our veterinarian on pain receptors, but is there a way we can stop them? I mean, should we be clicker training them? I'm like, I don't know. You know, I, I'm probably an outlier with, um, you know, with, with that in the sense of I'm very much about quality and happiness and what do they want to do and how do they want, how they want, you know, how do they want to live. You know, technically a 12 or 13 year old kitty should still be able to, if he's feeling well and pain is well managed, jump on, jump on those counters um, or provide the the means to do it more safely. So like we talked about um, during our last, uh, our last session where you have little steps and stools and, and get them to, you know, to do that. I, I think it's really interesting that pets, when they see and learn that easier way, that's, that's the way they, they do it. So if you have the means to treat, teach them um, that there's a better, easier way, they will, they will take it. Um, just like the slippery floors and the dogs with arthritis, when they slip in and slide, if you have those little yoga mat runners, they will very quickly learn to only go on, you know, that um, during the stretches of the slippery floor. Because well, can you give that that whole detail? Because I think you gave that when we talked before. That is such a huge piece of advice, and it probably is, was really bad of me to play fetch with my dog on the. Oh, a slick wood floor last night. Um, but give that, like, explain what that is, because that's huge. The, just the, the home modification? The, the, the yoga mat and what the purpose of all that does. Yeah, so if you have an older dog or, or even, I mean, a kitty cat, but it's basically older dogs, especially the bigger they get, the more slippery hardwood surfaces are or tiles are, and you'll often see them slipping and sliding a little bit when they try and get up or down, or when they're walking across the wood floor, they're a little bit more, a little bit more unsure of themselves. If you get yoga mat runners, um, that's just a cheap solution, um, and trial that on their runways, like underneath where they, where they eat and drink, or along hallways, um, you'll see it, it gives them traction and stability, and it's almost, it, it's an amazing um, the difference that it will make for for the pet. 
I love that one. So a lot of medications have been mentioned in the chat. I want to definitely give a huge shout out to, to both Julie and Ginny for being in the chat tonight and helping answer. But there's a lot of questions about uh, side effects. Like what do we, how should we manage the side effects of some of these medications between the constipation, the loopiness, though the loopinesses can be funny initially, but not for long periods of time. Um, but how should pet owners be approaching that and really understanding what the impacts can be? Yeah, I mean, constipation is really rare side effect of pain medications in, in dogs and cats. Um, I think we have a sense of, you know, I took pain medications, I mean, TMI, I mean, not me, but <laughs> just what you, what you hear and people will be like, oh, you know, it's, it's, it was constipating. I didn't like it. But dogs and cats don't tend to have that as, as we do on, on, on the human side of things. Um, the loopiness, so my guess is this has to do with the medication gabapentin. And I think one of the biggest things that, that I see, uh, gabapentin is a really um, important part of pain management in chronic pain and neuropathic pain. So things like joint disease and back disease and back pain. And there's recommended doses in the veterinary drug book but the thing with gabapentin is that if you start it at normal doses, you're going to get those loopy side effects. And gabapentin has does cause loopiness, wobbliness. And then what happens is dogs get started on a normal dose of this, which is what's written. Um, and then we give that medication and we see that and we sort of freak out going, oh my God, this, this, this is a horrible medication for them. This didn't work. This is a bad drug. He didn't, he, it didn't work well for him or he didn't tolerate it well. When in reality, the thing with gabapentin, does anyone here have a pet on gabapentin? So there's a lot actually in the chat. Um, they've all been mentioning it. So yeah, talk a little bit more about that. Cause I, Brenda, you would know better, um, as you've been going through it, if it's been positive on gabapentin or negative, because I haven't looked at those. Yeah, so, Wrigley, Wrigley was on it for a while too. So no, I was just gonna say, it's like, so it's so, 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 so common. So it's a great, a great thing, Dr. Shea, to share more information about. Yeah, and that is, so gabapentin is one of my favorite medications, but there be, there comes that education component to it. And my mantra, and, and I see Diane Diane here is my, my low and slow mantra um, with gabapentin, and, and she, she knows as well, is um, gabapentin is a medication that for the first three days or so has sedation side effects. And we can relay that to families and we can tell people or have it written in the discharge instructions. But when you get home and you give it, that, that all goes, goes out the window. You just set sedation side effect and you're like, oh my God, this, is, this drug is bad. So I've learned over the years to start it very low and slow. So literally say a normal dose is 10 milligrams per kilogram of body weight, um, you know, two to three times a day. And you can go up from there. I started at three milligrams per kilogram and I give it only at night for the first three to five nights so that they do have those loopy side effects. They sleep through it. And then, so by going low and slow, I've yet to have a pet in all my years of pain management have those loopy side effects. And then you can get them through that period and then all of a sudden you know they're adjusted to the medication and they're adjusted in a way that is not freaky to see when you see a wobbly loopy pet um but that pretty much prevents it altogether but it's, so, it's a great medication so speaking of those let's talk about some non-pharmacological options for pets someone was i mean i know it's also i suppose you could call baby aspirin someone was asking about baby aspirin but let's talk about the the non-prescription uh, options for pet owners to help with their pet's pain? Yeah, so baby aspirin, um, I would recommend against. Um, I'll, and I'll just take that as a side note because there are some things in the body called coxes, and that is the inflammatory pathways. And things like baby aspirin aren't selective to which cox they block in the body. So you can have an increased risk of ulcerations in the intestines and GI effects. So it is much better to use a type of that is selective to 
that COX receptor. And that's probably getting way more in the weeds. But basically, baby aspirin can come with bad side effects. You can reduce those side effects with a medication um, like Rimadyl. They're doing the same things essentially, but Rimadyl or Medicam is a safer, a safer alternative because um, it's selective to, to the receptor it, it chooses. Um, you know, and we talked a bit, you know, uh, supplements and things like that. And uh, when we talked about senior pet care, and I think, you know, the big thing is when I look, when I approach pain management with a patient or a pet, what I do is I look at the big picture. And the first question that I work to find out with the families is where on the pain scale are we? And, like, you know, I go through, we go through the pain scales and we pick and choose the signs that we're seeing. And then we determine what level of pain a pet is on. So if a pet is at a pain scale level of one or two, then just supplements is a great way to go. But if we have a pet that has a pain level of say five, six, or seven, a supplement alone is not gonna cut it. So the more important question is not so much about the supplement, but to back up a little bit more and, and first figure out what level of pain their pet is at. Um, if it's low pain, then supplements like, you know, CBD and um, omega-3 fatty acids, uh, Adequan, um, glucosamine, chondroitin, all the things that we, that we think about with the supplement, that is good. If we are getting to a more moderate or severe pain, that's unfortunately not going to cut it but it doesn't mean it's not another layer to pain management. So it all goes back to, you know, how can we address as many pain pathways as possible? Um, Turmeric is another, is another supplement that has anti-inflammatory property. Um, so it's, to me, it's not a either or, but it's like, how do we pull everything that we have at our disposal together to make a plan that makes the most sense for this particular pet with this particular disease with this particular level of pain. So like you're saying, there's not a great silver, silver bullet for that. Um, with, you know, with supplements, like we talked about before, those are best in my mind to start when a pet is in. So if we're looking at say a dog or a large breed dog, when they're around four years of age, if they're 12 and they're really severely arthritic, that glucosamine ain't gonna do it. <laughs> um, you know, we need we need more more layers than that. Doesn't mean it can't help as another sprinkle on the cupcake icing, um, but it ain't gonna be the icing. Um, and it so sure is. <laughs> you brought up CBD and it showed up earlier in the chat and then it started popping up again. So let's really dive into you know is that something that the pet owner should take on their own? Is there a special kind? Is there something they should be working directly with their veterinarian? The pet owner should take on their own? <laughs> Meaning <laughs> to uh, administer to their pet. <laughs> we should all take some of that. <laughs> um, so so it, that is, um, I, I wouldn't say a loaded question in the sense where, um, I mean, I am a believer in CBD products. Um, CBD works on the cannabinoid system, which is another pain pathway. So if you can work on the neuropathic pain pathway and the inflammatory pain pathway and the cannabinoid pathway, that's, that's another layer. Um, again, it goes back to that. If we are at severe pain or moderate pain, CBD alone probably isn't going to cut it. If you are at mild pain, um, it very well might cut it. But to me, the magic happens when you when you look at the situation and bring things together. But CBD is something that we use in the majority of our of our hospice patients. I think the key with that is the big key with that is the source and what types of testing has been done to show that it is a good source of CBD. Um, there's a thing called a certificate of analysis, which tests the components and the toxins and the pesticides and everything that could um, affect a pet or a person. And if 
a product doesn't provide that, then I would I would hesitate to to recommend or use that because there's a lot of um, witchery that that's happening around CBD where there's hemp this and hemp biscuit that and CBD this, and it's a little bit of the wild wild west um, when it comes to that. So it's really getting a a, a good recommended brand from your veterinarian or from a company that offers a certificate of analysis or researching it and saying to your vet, you know, here's, here's what I've, um, you know, come up with. Do you have a recommendation for these? The tricky thing is, is like for, so I'm in California. It wasn't until January that I could finally talk about CBD to, to pet parents, to the hospice families. So small at the dispensary down the street could be like, yeah, I give your dog five drops of this. And, uh, you know, but me, a trained veterinarian who actually understands the pain pathways couldn't, couldn't say anything to pet parents for risk of losing my license um, by talking about that. So it really depends on, you know, where you live and what your veterinarian feels comfortable with. So legally, I cannot dispense it. Um, I cannot prescribe it, but I can now have a conversation where I can say we can give one mig per kig once a day divided um, and guide pet parents. Whereas before I could, I couldn't even do that. I mean, that was like five months ago. Oh my goodness. Well, I will say that's obviously a hot topic. People want to know a lot about it, but um, we've got a lot of questions with regards to uh, the use of human medicine in, in pet care for pain management, but then, and I just kind of, then I want to jump back over, back over to supplements, but let's dive into, you know, what should pet parents be aware of there? What is effective? Yeah. So, I mean, a lot of pain medications in pets are human medications. Like gabapentin is a human medication. Amantadine, which is another type of, um, an MDA receptor antagonist, but it, it works on another pain pathway, but that is a human antiviral medication that is used for chronic pain in people now and in pets. So things, there are medications formulated for just pets, but there's a lot of crossover between human medications like Tylenol, Gabapentin, Amantadine, um, and then dog or cat only, like Medicam, Remedil, the, the, the classic things, um, Galaprint. Um, as, a, as a quick aside, if your pet can't take NSAIDs, like with kidney disease, or if they have other underlying, underlying disease, Galaprint is an anti-inflammatory that's safe for the kidneys. Um, and not many people I find are aware that there's an alternative um, if their pet can't take like Remedil or Medicam. So, Long story short of all of that um, is to, you know, talk to your veterinarian um, before reaching for, you know, for a medication. Um, you know, what is it? Tylenol is a medication we use all the time, but it's not where one is good, four is better. Um, there is dosing based on, you know, body weight and the amount that they can get maximum in a day. So there's, um, there's a lot more to it than just is this, can I give Tylenol to my pet? Yes, but there's a lot of other um, things that, that go into that decision. So uh, just really quick back on CBD before everyone runs out to those states that it's where it's legal and start uh, buying brownie. Well, they can't do brownies, obviously, for many reasons. But um, uh, so people are asking, what is the appropriate dose for a dog? So we don't want to be giving out doses because we don't know weights and things like that, right? I mean, or is there a standard approach? Uh, it depends, and it depends on. Um, so, I mean, I'm I'm comfortable sharing because you can look this up online, and I would rather say it as as a veterinarian. Um, but it can range anywhere from 0 0.5 to two milligrams per kilogram once a day divided. So, whether that's four times a day or six times a day, when I work with hospice patients. Um, it's a generally a, a frailer, frailer population. Um, I start at the 0 0.5 mg per kg daily dose and I go up from there. And then, you know, I think the important thing with pain management, um, whether it's CBD or any medication, is every pet is so different and that 
the idea of here, take two of these twice a day and call me in two weeks, that, that does not work as ideally for pain management. It is, there's so much nuancing and fine tuning and adjustments to find that, that sweet spot. So I tend to be very low and slow and you know kind of layer things on. Um, but if you have a bad side effect, it doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad drug. So say you did CBD and you're like, oh my gosh, I mean, CBD technically doesn't get you stoned because there's no THC component to it. Um, but just say you had adverse effects. It doesn't necessarily mean that CBD is not a good thing to give your pet. It just means maybe we need a lower dose or maybe we need a higher dose. You know, it's not doing what it's supposed to do. Well, maybe we need a higher dose and we need to bring something else in into the mix so that they work together uh, more synergistically and better. So we're coming up on our end. So I wanted to ask, because I think this is one of the most powerful questions, because even um, uh, more so, because as we're trying to learn what pain actually means for our pets, and then what we'll do is we'll do a quick run through and see if there's more questions, and then we'll do our final toast. But when the veterinarian says to give the pain meds as needed, what does that actually mean? Because you don't have someone going, my headache's starting to hurt more, ouch. You know, you don't have them saying, it's time for some more. Yeah, and you know, the as needed, it's, I, I, get, I get that. And some pets, it's as, as needed, certain medications. But so say, like, like certain medications like gabapentin don't work as needed. It has to chronically be in the body, sustained. Okay like for, for forever. Um, so, cause it takes a certain amount of time to actually get up to therapeutic levels in the body. So giving gabapentin as needed doesn't really work because it takes up to potentially 14 days to really get to a level where it's actually doing something for the body um, for pain management wise. So the way I look at it, we'll take a geriatric dog who's got really bad arthritis and he hurts and the idea of an anti-inflammatory, say Rimadyl, as needed. In my mind, it's needed every day to provide comfort. And it's much better to just give it that once a day or, or twice a day, depending on your dosing schedule, every day and keep things at an even keel for him. As opposed to, oh my God, I got really hurt. Okay, here's a pill. Okay, I feel better. Oh my God, I got really hurt. Okay, here's a pill, I feel better. It, so you, you create these spikes of discomfort that they're always going through instead of just keeping it as even and steady keeled as, as possible. So it depends on the medication, but my approach, and again, depending age and disease and what's happening, keeping as needed to daily um, is what makes the most sense for those old geriatric pets. So can we get, can you give the address that we can put in the chat, the actual for the pain scale? We're getting more questions about that. I want to be sure that people know that pain scale. Yeah. So if, so our website is pethospice.com and we have a, oh yeah, we, <laughs> you'll like this. Um, we have a, um, it says free education and there are learning modules in there. And there is a module called recognizing pain in dogs. And there's a module called recognizing pain in cats because cats and dogs show pain completely different. So you can go into the resource section um, or just go to that module and the pain scales are, are in there available for download and you can use them however, however you want. But you can watch along in the video and learn all of each one of those little boxes. You can learn about what that means and how that looks. And then you can fill out that pain scale and talk to your veterinarian about it. So now what you're doing is you're learning the language of your pet's pain. Your veterinarian knows the language of pain, but now you have, now you're speaking the same language. Um, so with that, you're able to do better for your pet, which is why I think, you know, pain management is just such an amazing, amazing thing. Um, there's nothing more rewarding than, than to make, you know, to hear someone say, you gave me my pet back. It's like, oh, oh. <laughs> that's, that's oh my goodness. 
So I am going to ask one more question, then we'll do our toast. I did put a survey into the chat for those of you. I'd love to hear what you think of this um, as we are pulling this together and creating a community for pet owners to address concerns that you have. So it's like three questions. Love to get your feedback. Um, but OK, so we're trying not to do this with our pets pain meds, but you know you're going to take them out on a long walk. How long does it take for the medication to begin to ease their pain? Humans, you know, it can vary, but is there kind of a, should we be giving them their meds 20 minutes before we go for a walk? Or, I mean, can we get some sudden guidance on that? Yeah, and I think that goes back to that whole idea of that plateau and consistency. So you give a medication, say Rimadyl, and it lasts 12 hours. So there's really no, peak performance of the medication know. once you get that plateau and that systemic. If you weren't doing that and if you were sort of spot checking them with pain, um, that would have something. But um, you know, just like if you feel a headache coming on and you took an Advil, um, it could work in 20 minutes technically. So just as long as it takes for the body to absorb, it starts doing its job. But as far as that peak effect or timing it for a walk, I think it's best to just time it for life, um, you know, and keep it keep it on the same same steady state so that there's there's always as much comfort as possible, no matter the time of day or what they're doing. So I do want to thank uh, Ellen. She's on camera. She's got a cute, cute little puppy. Um, she's on page three for me. She might be on a different page for each one of you, but I love if you've got your pet handy, love for you guys to at least, if, if you can physically pick them up. Brenda is unable to. She has a very large dog, um, but his name is Wrigley. So we want to be sure that if you want to show off your pets while we are getting ready to do um, our final toast. But you know, please, please show some love in the chat of what you think about this meeting. If you don't do the survey, because we want, if we, if we really praise uh, Dr. Shea enough, she'll come back again. Um, because I would like to let you all know that this is out of the kindness of her heart. Uh, this is something that she's doing um, and supporting us as we are trying to bring really powerful conversations forward. So with that, Dr. Shea, let's start with our final toast. Yes, I finished mine. This was the biggie, so now we're down to this. So, all righty. Uh, well, I just want to end it with a toast to each one of you pet parents here showing up and learning and trying to be the best advocate that you can for your babies um, because you are the most important thing in their life. And thank you for, for showing up tonight for them and for us. Thank you, everyone. Cheers. And thank you for those on Facebook that showed up for us this evening, too. Love you all for coming. And with that, I'm going to stand for one more second so that people can get their statements in. If you've never been on Zoom before, uh, I will force quit this in a minute. But in the lower uh, right hand corner, there's an end button and you should be able to exit out. But I promise you, I will help you with that as well if you can't get out. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's like, well, you know, because sometimes you're like, how do I, I'm not quite sure. So we always want to be sure that we are helping folks out. And Linda, very happy you came back, uh, even though with the time change, really happy with that. Leslie, thank you for coming. Tammy, so excited that you were here. Darcy, thank you for coming. Sue, you as well. Darcy, awesome. Uh, Patrice, thank you. Trying to get as many of you as possible. Kim and Panda, oh my God, beautiful dog. Beautiful, beautiful dog. Julie and Ginny, I neglected to say thank you for all your hard work in this chat. That was incredible. So thank you, thank you, thank you. You guys are phenomenal uh, as we're doing it. We ended up having 129. So that is pretty good for people coming into a conversation all about pets. So you guys have a great night and we'll talk to you guys soon.